The Oscars are nearly here, and because, just like us, the Academy has a flawless 92-year record of always picking the objectively best films, we figured we'd join forces and pick our favorites of their favorites. So these are our picks for the 10 best Oscar winners of all time. On this list, we're going to focus in on one Oscar category at a time. So, kicking things off at number 10, we're starting on the crafts with the best editing winners. Sometimes it's hard to quantify, but you know it when you feel it. Some of the best of the best deftly balance multiple plot lines, weaving from one to the other with a keen sense of flow, like Pass Honorees, The Departed, Traffic, and Lord of the Rings Return of the King. Others use montage to build a massive cacophony of motion into cohesive action tapestries, a la Saving Private Ryan and Mad Max Fury Road. And more still, create a kinetic sense of pace, the pressure of time pushing up against every individual moment, like in High Noon and Whiplash. However, our absolute favorite kind of Academy Award-winning editing elegantly blends multiple disparate moments in time into a single, understandable throughline, as in The Social Network, JFK, Deer Hunter, and most of all, our first pick, Alan Himes' win in 1979 for All That Jazz. It's showtime, folks. A stream of consciousness, subjective approach to montage, Alan Heim and Bob Fosse's non-linear and non-literal assembly of all that jazz may seem familiar if relatively modern today, but back in 1979 when it found its way into the spotlight, the editing seemed like something straight out of the French New Wave. Jumping not just through time, but between reality and fantasy, all that jazz is semi-autobiography of a dancer, choreographer, filmmaker, and fast-living Fosse insert brings to fruition the ideas he and editor Heim began experimenting with on their previous film, Lenny, as it free-associated its way through a life. The final result has a musicality, a kineticism, and a rhythm that is anchored to a subconscious pulse. The editing flits through the story with a mind and an agenda of its own, without ever sacrificing coherence in its strive for better poetry, and the Academy was right to recognize it. For our first performance slot, we're looking at Best Supporting Actor, and at its finest, the supporting category honors performers outside the lead role that nonetheless have outsized impacts on their films, even with their lesser screen time. And of the actors that have done that best, we think first of those like Martin Landau, who absolutely transformed into the larger-than-life Bella Lugosi, or Christoph Waltz, who combined irresistible charisma, charm, and good manners with enormous evil, or Kevin Kline, who managed comedy perfection in A Fish Called Wanda. Joel Gray set an amazingly uncanny table in Cabaret and then danced his way across it. Joe Pesci put the complex in Napoleon Complex, and J.K. Simmons commanded every frame with his presence. On the other hand, actors like Timothy Hutton, Mahershala Ali, Hang S. Noor, and Robin Williams turned in performances marked by restraint, and the movies were still all the better for it. We love Gig Young in They Shoot Horses, Don't They, Harold Russell in The Best Years of Our Lives, and James Coburn in Affliction. However, our next pick is handily in the Boulder is Better category. We're talking about Heath Ledger's unforgettable bow as the Joker in The Dark Knight. Do you want to know why I use a knife? Guns are too quick. You can't savor all the little emotions. It's hard to overstate how completely Heath Ledger's performance dominated not just the awards conversations, but all pop culture conversations for an entire year. And his posthumous win felt, at the time, like much-deserved recognition for a career cut short in its prime. Following up a near-miss three years prior for lead actor in Brokeback Mountain, the award was surely overdue. But it also helped that his performance was one for the history books. It defined the summer blockbuster season, launched Christopher Nolan into the stratosphere, breathed new life into a character, a hero, and an entire studio. He was quoted, requoted, misquoted, memed, and endlessly Halloween costumed. He single-handedly coalesced the fantastical and the darkly believable in superhero villains into a brief vision of what the DC Universe could be all about. There was a real, palpable darkness to it that sent rumors swirling to this day, but one thing is for sure. 
That year, Heath Ledger was the best thing that appeared on any screen. Why so serious? Next up at number eight, we're looking at screenplays, and we're combining the originals with adapteds because overcategorizing things is for horses. Of course, that makes things really tough because there's as much skill and artistry in adapting something as there is in creating it from whole cloth. There have been a ton of fantastic screenplays lauded over the years. All the President's Men, The Bridge on the River Kwai, Chinatown, Dog Day Afternoon, The Exorcist, Fargo, Goodwill Hunting, her, in the heat of the night, we're literally going down the alphabet here and they're all fantastic. Top contenders include Network, Sunset Boulevard, The Apartment, and Pulp Fiction. But our pick here is easy because way back in 1941, best original screenplay went to the excessively overqualified Citizen Kane. Oh, Emily, I don't spend that much time on the newspaper. It isn't just the time. It's what you print, attacking the president. You mean Uncle John? I mean the president of the United States. He's still Uncle John. He's still a well-meaning fathead who's running a pack of high-pressure crooks around his administration. This whole oil scandal. He happens to be the president, Charles, not you. That's a mistake that will be corrected one of these days. Screenwriting is largely regarded as a particularly structural task, one whose brilliance lies in cleverly arranging slices of time. And there was no arrangement quite like the one in Kane that moves from newsreel to newsroom, to trusted insiders, to windows to the past, and then zooms through a lifetime of highlights to create the impression of a man who was larger than life. The story of the screenplay of Citizen Kane has recently sparked new interest thanks to Fincher's recent retelling in Mank, and its writing was brilliant for an unaccountable number of reasons, but believe it or not, this was the only award that Citizen Kane actually won at the Oscars, where Orson Welles himself was booed, and the trophy was shared contentiously between Welles himself and Mankiewicz. But whoever you believe to be its true author, it's impossible to ignore the architectural achievement that is the story of Citizen Kane, a towering construction of multiple perspectives told via investigation and flashback. The shape of the screenplay was utterly unprecedented in its period of cinema's relative adolescence. And amidst an evening of snubs, this singular recognition was one thing that even the Academy managed to get right. Alternating back to performers, it's time for the best, best supporting actress. And the dichotomy here is the same as it was with the boys. You've got your scene stealers, Angelina Jolie from Girl Interrupted, Rita Moreno from West Side Story, Marissa Tomei from My Cousin Vinny, Viola Davis in Fences, Lupita Nyong'o in 12 Years a Slave, and oh man, Tatum O'Neill at 10 years old in Paper Moon. And you've also got your role players, like Linda Hunt in The Year of Living Dangerously, Ruth Gordon in Rosemary's Baby, Patty Duke in The Miracle Worker, and a little-known, soon-to-be-forgotten bit player in Kramer vs. Kramer. And then, you've got our number seven pick, who somehow simultaneously balanced perfect subtlety with unforgettable screen presence as she stood atop them all. Monique as Mary in Precious. Precious was born around the same time Miss West's son got killed. The summertime. She was born the summertime, remember? Remember that? I was born in November. November. Yeah. That's right. My Scorpio child. Monique's win for Precious was another coronation marred by awards night controversy and contention, but one where top-tier talent still ultimately won the day. Previously known almost exclusively as a comedian, Monique was cast by Lee Daniels into a role that was about as far from funny as one can imagine, but he saw in her a brilliance all others had missed, as she turned in an unforgettable performance that was as painfully sadistic as it was deeply tragic. Monique brought equal levels of gravitas, restraint, insight, and tremendous authenticity to a character that could have so easily fallen into the arch or the one note portraying cruelty with a sense of humanity that belongs in textbooks for either acting or psychology or both, which is why her win, above all others in this category, is most worth remembering. Taking us to the halfway mark, we're turning abroad. The Oscars, as Hollywood's annual ceremony of self-congratulation, are an incredibly American event, but each year they deign to acknowledge that the rest of the world at least kind of exists in its own also-ran category, Best Foreign Language Film. Which means that Hollywood competes across dozens of categories, while the best of everywhere else competes in just one. So, the category is pretty much always filled with masterpieces. From Amour, to The Great Beauty, to Day for Night, to A Separation, Ida, Parasite, 
War and Peace, Z, Eight and a Half, Rashomon, and Bicycle Thieves. So many of these films belong not just in conversations about the best of the year, but about the best of all time. However, surely the absolute best to ever receive it was Ingmar Bergman for his final masterpiece, Fanny and Alexander. Harry. The third and final foreign language win for Bergman after The Virgin Spring and Through a Glass Darkly, this Oscar represented one last recognition for what was at least intended to be the capstone of the auteur's career. Won alongside craft awards for costume design, art direction, and cinematography, the foreign language submission came at the expense of any eligibility for the Best Picture category, which it certainly deserved and might have even won. The film itself is a true masterpiece, with a remarkable sensitivity for the experience of seeing the world through a child's eyes alongside an unbelievably nuanced account of the shifting dynamics of an extended family. And it is one of the finest and most worthy of being cherished films ever to be lauded with an award. <laughs> Back on the performance side of things, our number five slot goes to the best actors. Screen time is no longer at a premium, so these awards tend to honor immersion, realism, and the execution of a big arc over economy of impact. Here we find greats like Jack Nicholson flying over the cuckoo's nest, Gregory Peck as the world's father, Atticus Finch, Philip Seymour Hoffman becoming Truman Capote, F. Murray Abraham as Salieri, Daniel Day-Lewis quite a few times, but especially for My Left Foot, Maximilian Schell defending war crimes, and Anthony Hopkins as a very particular foodie. And for our pick, we're giving it to a black and white working class tale of a washed up boxer. So while sure, Marlon Brando could have been a contender here, our favorite best actor instead just quotes him, Robert De Niro in Raging Bull. I recall every fall, every hook, every jab, a voice where a guy can get rid of his flab, as you know, my life was in drab. Though I'd much, though I'd rather hear you cheer when you delve, when I, though I'd rather hear you cheer when I delve into Shakespeare. A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. I haven't had a winner in six months. Much like Monique's turn in Precious, De Niro's most impressive award win finds the fragility behind cruelty and lays it bare and vulnerable for display. The cool, collected, violent, tough guy carapace that has so marked De Niro's career is nothing but a flimsy shell in Scorsese's portrait of toxic masculinity before anyone had even heard of the concept. Jealous, paranoid, vengeful, and also somehow simultaneously pathetic and sympathetic, there was also a transformative aspect to De Niro's performance, and God does the Academy love to award actor transformations. So, on top of his veritable acting clinic, De Niro also portrayed LaMotta in two very different shapes, first in fine fighting form, and then way, way out of it. Raging Bull shows a range and a bravery in De Niro that stands out both in his body of work and amidst the work of all the actors who have ever stood on stage to accept a golden statue. So, for all that, plus a shapeshift, we can't help but admire it most. Returning to the crafts, next up we're looking at cinematography. And here, the criteria isn't just what's the absolute prettiest, although it sure helps, but what combination of camera work and lighting best served the story? From Charles Rosher's revolutionary dynamism in Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans, to Robert Krasker's film noir cant in The Third Man, Vittorio Storaro created the feeling of psychedelic madness in Vietnam for Apocalypse Now, while Roger Deakins created the photographic effect of Not Enough Time in 1917. Nestor Almendros and Haskell Wexler captured beautiful frontier Americana for Days of Heaven, while Robert Ellswit rendered those same expanses dangerous and foreboding. But we think the Academy got it most right in 1976 when they awarded John Alcott the Oscar for Best Cinematography for his work with Stanley Kubrick on Barry Lyndon. Bleu. 
Soft, bleary-eyed, candle-lit, immaculately composed and inspired by the Dutch masters, Barry Lyndon's cinematography combines the techniques of the Renaissance with the most cutting-edge camera technology of the era. It is perhaps most famous for lighting some scenes exclusively by candlelight, made possible by ultra-fast NASA lenses from the Apollo program loaned to Kubrick in exchange, presumably, for his underrated work on the moon landing. The result is like a three-hour-long living painting. The film looks and feels like no other, utterly unique in its flavor with a palette perfectly evoking the sense of the period. That, when combined with the astonishing composition of museum-like tableaus that appear non-stop throughout the film, gives the story a sense of historical legend practically dripping from every frame. So, yeah, it looks pretty goddamn good, and in the annals of all the films to have received Hollywood's highest honors for beauty, we think Barry Lyndon stands out as the brightest among them. For our last performance category on this list, we have our favorite Best Actress winner. And our favorites here include Charlize Theron, completely transformed and bringing humanity to a monster, Kathy Bates, impossible to look away from while unraveling from superfan into a villain, Holly Hunter, spellbinding without a single word in the piano, Julie Andrews, an icon of all of our childhoods in Mary Poppins, Shirley MacLaine moving effortlessly between humor and melodrama without sacrificing a shred of realism, Anne Bancroft in The Miracle Worker, Kate Blanchett in Blue Jasmine, Vivian Lee in Streetcar, Liza Minnelli in Cabaret, and of course, that little known actress from Kramer vs. Kramer back again with a vengeance in the devastating Sophie's Choice. I wonder why she never worked again. However, whatever her name was, we think she's ever so slightly edged out for the best, best actress winner of all time by one Elizabeth Taylor for her astounding turn in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. It snapped. Finally, not, not me, it, the whole arrangement. Boy, you can go on forever and after. Everything is manageable. You make all sorts of excuses to yourself. To, to, to hell with it. This is life. Maybe tomorrow he'll be dead. Maybe tomorrow you'll be dead. All sorts of excuses. Then one day... One night, something happens and snap, it breaks and you just don't give a damn anymore. Where De Niro's win for Raging Bull recognized a performance that traced the wide expanse of human behavior across both sides of a long decline, Elizabeth Taylor's performance traces the extremities of what is possible over the course of a single night. The film adaptation of Edward Albee's whirlwind tour through the Museum of Non-Physical Violence, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton square off and entangle a young couple they've met into a series of games designed to put a fresh face on their long-simmering contempt. And Taylor's Martha is the drunken, reckless captain of the their night's insanity ship. Her performance is a tour de force. She chews every piece of scenery in their little house and then starts in on the walls and the ceiling, effortlessly slipping between layers of farce designed to preserve a rotting marriage without ever losing sight of the real human buried deep beneath them all. Her turn was theatrical, as the text demanded, but also so tragically believable, and it delivered a gut punch still felt nearly 60 years in the future. You're a monster. You are. I'm loud, and I'm vulgar, and I wear the pants in the house because somebody's got to. But I am not a monster. Closing it at number two, we've only got the heavy hitters left. And for our penultimate slot, that means Best Director. The award for not quite the film, but the filmmaker most deserving of recognition. And who could it be? Maybe Billy Wilder for threading a perfect tonal needle in the apartment. Or perhaps William Wyler for expanding the scope of cinema to epic size in Ben-Hur. Could it be the Brothers Coen for their impeccable deconstruction of the Western in No Country for Old Men? Or Joseph Mankiewicz for the sizzling energy of All About Eve? Or John Ford for his sensitivity to human nobility in The Grapes of Wrath? Thankfully, when it comes to recognizing directors for enormous achievements, we don't think the Academy ever got it quite as right as they did when they recognized David Lean for Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> Lawrence, not this. Go round. Damascus, Lawrence. Damascus. No prisoners. <laughs> 
Beyond most other films ever made, the directing in Lawrence of Arabia demonstrates an astonishing command of the medium of cinema. From the cinematography, to the editing, to the performances, to the structure, to the costuming, to the design, to the music, David Lean employs every possible tool available to an effect that has literally come to define the word epic when it comes to the silver screen. He marshaled together enormous talent in every single department, set out to tell an impossibly huge tale, and kept every disparate piece of craft together all in service of a single unified vision that is marvelous to behold. Displaying clear mastery over everything from the intimate to the immense, the individual parts summed up to one of the most iconic and memorable examples of the art form ever committed to celluloid, and on a massive scale. And what is incredible directing if it isn't the moving of heaven and earth? The combination of craft with artistry, the successful coordination of a million different moving pieces into something that the world will likely never forget. We have no idea what the answer to that is, which is why we're sticking with David Lean and Lawrence of Arabia. Finally, at number one, the slot you've all been waiting for, Best Irving G. Thalberg Memorial Award for creative producers whose body of work reflects consistently high-quality production. Of course, since everyone knows that category is a clear no contest in favor of Daryl Zanuck, we'll have to settle for picking the best, best picture instead. And here, the choices are rough. From repeats in our previous categories, like, uh... Lawrence of Arabia, and mentions we've already name-dropped, like The Apartment, and On the Waterfront, and All About Eve, to old mega-classics like Gone with the Wind and Casablanca, to newer works of brilliance like Parasite and Moonlight. It's hard to ignore the best years of our lives, and it happened one night, and all quiet on the Western Front, but for us, there's really only one choice here. The best, best picture win ever won has to be for Francis Ford Coppola's 1972 masterpiece, The Godfather. We've known each other many years, but this is the first time you ever came to me for counsel or for help. I can't remember the last time that you invited me to your house for a cup of coffee. For an award that so preferentially recognizes the accomplishments of Hollywood above all else, there is perhaps no movie more quintessentially American than The Godfather. Endlessly rewatchable, perfectly crafted with obsessive attention to detail on the part of Coppola, and made up of one of the finest cast ensembles ever assembled, it truly is a masterpiece. There is a reason The Godfather has so long sat at the forefront of conversations about the best of cinema, all the way from the critic circles to the viewers' living rooms to our own movie lists, where we have awarded it slots more than any other film. It's really, really just that goddamn good. It is emblematic of all the things the Academy has most awarded, both for good and for ill. And over a half a century later, after dozens of rewatches, it's still just as genius as it was in the 70s. For all the times the Academy has really put their foot in the mouth by awarding a forgettable film when a classic was right there for the recognizing, this was not one of them. Which is why we think that The Godfather's Best Picture win is one of the best Academy Awards ever handed out. So what do you think? Did we leave out any of your favorite Academy Award winners? Do you disagree with any of our picks? Well, you can take it up with PricewaterhouseCooper, man. We don't count the votes. In the meantime, be sure to subscribe to IGN Movies and TV for more Cinefix movie lists.